Welcome to another episode of the SPE podcast, the place where we share interesting stories of interesting people. My name is Louis Morton and today with me is Melissa Siegel, who is a professor for migration studies at Maastricht Graduate School of Governance and well as well as UNO Merit and teaches many courses related to migration and also is doing a lot of executive education for government officials. Today we will chat um, about different things. Firstly about uh, you, Melissa, and your personal background. Also about your YouTube channel as well as the depth and breadth of migration. So just uncovering that term a little bit. I'm really happy that you're here today and excited to chat about that. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> Of course. Um, yeah, let's maybe get started right away. Um, so we're here at the beautiful New Tapein building in Maastricht, um, and you are here a professor. And my question in general is just, how did you end up in the Netherlands uh, at the university here? And what is your path um, until here? <laughs> That's a great question because this was definitely not my original plan. And like we know with everything in life, that's often the case, even also with migration. So I first came to the Netherlands actually during my bachelor's degree, but then I was in Utrecht um, and I was doing my study abroad and I uh, really loved Europe and decided I wanted to come back. So I came back to the Netherlands since it has a lot of very good English speaking master's programs. My idea was to come to the Netherlands just to do a master's and then move on. And basically I came back to the Netherlands to do a master's and never left. So I ended up actually doing two masters, then coming to Maastricht actually for my PhD because I was very interested in the new school of governance that had been created here. And I cared a lot about working more in development in a very multidisciplinary environment. And that's exactly what the Maastricht Graduate School of Governance had and uh, Maastricht University. So this was my first choice to do my PhD. I came here to do my PhD. Honestly, I never planned to have an academic career. I planned to finish my PhD and go on and work for a UN agency, um, maybe the World Bank somewhere else. But, um, well, I think Maastricht is a lovely place and I got a lot of offers that I couldn't refuse. So I stayed and I've been very happy and very lucky to be able to build my career here. And I still get to work with lots of the international organizations I had planned to work for before. And now I just get to have the best of both worlds. So the policy world, the international world, and also the university with flexibility and lots of interesting students. Well, that sounds like a perfect match for you, I guess. <laughs> it is, and it is. For your yes. interests. That was really nice. Um, so how did you... Maybe, so becoming a professor, I don't know how natural that path is. I think it's definitely something really interesting and also something unique. But how, how did you approach that? So how, how did you end up being a professor uh, then, I mean, after the academic journey that you already had? <laughs> That's a really good question because, as I said, my plan was never to have an academic career. And um, I do feel really lucky to have been able to become a full professor at Maastricht University, also quite young comparatively. Um, I think what really happened was, you know, I, I came in at the School of of governance. I was working on migration. I was able to really build something. I was lucky to also have bosses that saw my talent. And I think that's always something that's really important for your career because everybody can work hard, but you need to have people on the other hand, on, on the other end that really recognize that. Um, and uh, I was really able to build something at the School of Governance. And that's, you know, I was able to actually um, create the migration specialization that um, is something that I teach in. And I created that, you know, 12, 13 years ago now. Um, I was able to build my own team and I think that made me interested in staying because I guess I'm a pretty entrepreneurial person which is maybe not uh, the most obvious fit for a university but being at a you know a young really dynamic public policy school gave me a lot of opportunities to build things the way that I also saw fit and I thought that migration was a really important thing that we should be working on and I was able to to build up a really amazing and dynamic migration team now and now we're more than 35 people working on migration at the School of Governance and you and you merit. So I guess that's that's kind of where I came. And, and I think for me, a traditional academic career wouldn't have been the right fit at all. Um, I get bored easily and I need to be doing a lot of different things. So having the mix of kind of typical, typical academia, teaching master students, especially students, you know, masters, PhDs, maybe some bachelors and then executive education. These are people who 
want to be in the class that they're taking. You know, it's not some tick box that they have to do to finish a degree or whatever. They want to be there. And that makes teaching those kinds of students really, really rewarding. And then next to that, I get to do the international policy work and, you know, run really interesting research projects and work with um, colleagues all over the world. So I think um, it, for me, it's a great mix. Well, I think it's quite interesting to work at the intersection of then research, policy, advice, and also teaching in that sense. So Absolutely. Uh, really cool. There are a lot of economies of scale to be had, to oh. be honest. <laughs> there are, definitely, because, I mean, the students get to benefit from the policy yeah. work, and obviously the research projects and things that we do there get to also benefit from the fact that we have a lot of other staff, a lot of junior staff, a lot of students that could potentially mm -hmm. also get onto projects. So it works quite well. Yeah. The world of policy in general is, to be honest, not that close to me and to the stuff mm -hmm. that I'm experienced in or that I learned about. So how do I need to imagine the way you advise governments globally in different topics? Like how, how does that go down in general? So there are a lot of different ways that this happens and I don't want to oversell it, you know, that I'm stepping into rooms and now all the ministers are listening to me because then obviously policy would look quite a bit different. Um, but it is the case that, for instance, um, I have, uh, you know, with my team, for instance, gone to Azerbaijan to help them um, completely reformulate their labor immigration policy. They're also a resource and oil rich country. They also have a lot of immigrants coming in in construction sector, but also actually in the in the oil sector. And we've helped them to revamp the way they do their labor immigration policy. Um, for instance, in Germany or in the Netherlands, it's very common that maybe Development Cooperation or the Ministry of Foreign Affairs will come to us and ask us about a specific program that they're doing with regard to migration. We might evaluate it and tell them, yes, it's working. No, it's not working. We suggest you tweak it here or there or maybe kill the program altogether. So I think this is where we can really add value. And we do the same things also with international organizations, um, you know, advising them also on programs and policies and training their people. So so there, there's quite a lot to do in the policy world. Well, it seems like a job with a lot of impact also and responsibility. Yeah. Speaking of impact, uh, maybe a little off topic. We do have this thing, COVID-19, going on at the moment. <laughs> yes. And I wonder how does your day look like in, in the COVID world at the moment? Kind of what, what does a day of Melissa Siegel look like currently? <laughs> That's a good question. And probably if you would ask me that um, also at another time, the answer would be similar in that, it depends. So my days are so varied um, that it can be from, so my days usually start anywhere between seven and eight o'clock in the morning, maybe with meetings, maybe with um, teaching, possibly with um, discussions with governments or international organizations, um, probably meetings with my team. Um, there's also quite a lot of, uh, you know, me needing to do normal things like write papers or grade papers or, you know, the normal pro professorial things. And then there's also the YouTube channel, which, you know, I need to think about new ideas, which is not difficult for ideas for the channel. I think implementing them is, is a different story. But um, I think in academia, we always have lots of ideas. So I think, a, a, you know, a normal day is mainly, though, me in my home office, which is a bit unfortunate and maybe also, unfortunately, lots and lots of Zoom meetings. But to be fair, there are a lot of positives and the negatives are very obvious, right? Like we, we all know what the negatives of COVID are for our own lives, but there are some silver linings. So, you know, the fact that um, you get to work from home means that you're also saving on commute, commuting time and it's easy to eat a healthy lunch because you're right there. But from a work perspective, it also means it's easier to see more students more quickly because all I have to do is, you know, change Zoom rooms. So it's quite efficient for me to have one on one meetings for students. I can also be in five countries in a day, which in other times was not so possible. I had to choose. Am I going to be in Rome today or am I going to be in Geneva today? And now in COVID times, I can be in both in within two hours. So it's I think those things have made um us more accessible in a way. Obviously, it's much better for the environment that, I mean, I, I am definitely a culprit of someone who was flying constantly. Um, and we as academics are not good about that. So we, we say we care about the environment and we have all eco-friendly things in our homes and maybe we drive um, electric cars or whatever, but we fly a lot. And that's something that we also need to recognize. And I think COVID has helped us all realize that we can do a lot of work and a lot of good without being 
physically in places. I mean, I teach courses, you know, in, in Kenya or our team is teaching courses in Nigeria or other places. I'm setting up a workshop right now, you know, in Afghanistan, um, but all virtually. And this is, um, this is really, I think, the future. And I hope that's where the future is going also for a lot of our work. It's also very efficient. Well, I think it's great to always see the positive things in such a yeah. big event that is happening right now. I think also it shows us how global the world has become mm -hmm. and how easy it is to access those different countries. And maybe just touching upon this point as well, uh, you mentioned your YouTube channel, which I think is quite fascinating. And that since you're also being accessible to a global audience, right, for mm -hmm. different people in different countries. But let's uh, just go back to the YouTube channel. So um, how did you decide to start a YouTube channel in, in your position? <laughs> that, that's also a really good question. You know, I think... Um, We as academics, I think in all fields, but also definitely within migration studies, you know, complain so often about the public not having the right information or not listening or not knowing or whatever. And I thought, you know, more and more, we need to do something about that. And we need to be honest and serious about doing that. We can't just say, oh, our, we write these papers or we teach our students or whatever. We need to do more. And if we care about getting correct, good information out to the public, we need to reach them in ways that are interesting to them. And I mean, YouTube is a huge platform. It's the second basically search engine on the internet. And, you know, people also said, well, why not do a podcast too? <laughs> um, and I think also a podcast is a really good idea for academics to do. Um, in my case, I wanted to go to the YouTube platform because basically people can listen to it or they can watch it. Um, and I just thought it had a bigger, uh, more global reach. So I really thought it was, this was my way to be able to engage even more with the broader public. It was time to stop complaining about things and start doing something about it. And um, I mean, luckily I'm not too uncomfortable on camera. I feel okay in that situation. So this was maybe an area that, um, you know, fed more to my strengths than doing something else. Other people are fantastic writers, then maybe being a blogger is a great idea or being super active on Twitter or whatever. Um, but I think we all as academics need to be doing our part more to make the information that we have, which is so vast, so much more accessible to the general public. You know, I think that when the public isn't getting the message, it's not their fault, it's our fault because we're not making it accessible or interesting enough for them. And so we need to be doing more in that regard. And I thought, luckily, as you said, I've become a full professor. So it doesn't mean I have to stop doing all of the normal um, things in a career, but it does mean that some pressure is off me to do maybe the traditional things that we always have to do to build our academic careers, like publishing a lot or other things. It doesn't mean I stop doing that, but it means that maybe I have a bit more leeway to move and adjust some of my time in other directions. And luckily also Maastricht University is caring more and more about having a different recognition and reward system. It's not just about publishing, publishing, publishing. Nowadays, you know, other things also matter and impact matters and outreach matters. And at least in the Dutch context, they talk so much about valorization. And so um, I think we have to start putting our money where our mouth is and do it. Well, it's such an interesting point you're making. Uh, I think the academic world is so deep in so many different areas, so there's so many things that are being done, but is it really accessible to a broader audience? That's, I think, the big question. Yeah. And I also think nowadays we have this notion of people are getting lazy, their attention spans shorten. So yes. who really reads an academic article in the end? We don't want the article, we want maybe the video. Exactly, and, even, and who even yeah. wants a 20-minute video? They want a yeah. three-minute video, yeah. right? So, yeah. yes, you have to be very, um, very good with your attention-grabbing possibilities. Yeah. Do you also see this as an opportunity to sharpen your thinking in a sense because you need to shorten a message from a big article down to maybe just a few minutes, a few clear messages that you want to place to, to people? Um, is that maybe a good exercise for you as well? Definitely. I think it's a good exercise for anyone. Um, you know, what's your elevator pitch and what? how can you put what you're doing into fewer words and be less complex about it? I think that's um, something that's important for anyone to be able to do. And yes, it also helps me focus and try at least to give clear messages in my in my videos. I'm still working on that. I'm not perfect um, by any means. Plenty of work to do there, but uh, getting better and better. 
Very cool. Uh, so where can people find your YouTube channel? Uh, just Google on YouTube. Um, yeah, actually, yeah. if you just Google on YouTube, Google Melissa YouTube. Siegel. Yeah. Uh, Google on YouTube, <laughs> yes. If you just search yes, on YouTube, yes, if you yes. actually, if you just Google Melissa Siegel YouTube, yeah. um, you should find the channel quite easily now. I mean, I have um, over 50, 60 videos at this point. Um, we do country case study series where we zoom into a specific country, but we also, um, you know, I cover so many other things on the channel, you know, just the basics of who's a migrant, why do people migrate, um, Where's the money going that everyone is sending? And I've got a new video coming out shortly on, you know, why you shouldn't use the term brain drain or some of these, you know, misconceptions that, that people also have about migration. We cover things like forced migration and refugees also on the channel. And of course, we're also always taking suggestions. So if people comment on the videos or, you know, shoot me a message or whatever for things that people are really interested in, we'll definitely try to get them in the mix. Cool. Sounds like a really successful feedback loop in a sense, right? And a good yeah. way to interact with people. We're doing our best. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, cool. Um, I think you made a good point already, also moving more uh, to migration and the work you're doing. I think there was this uh, inauguration lecture called Death and Breath of Migration uh, that I had a look at online, <laughs> yes. um, where you kind of tried to demystify a few myths also around migration and really show what it means in our world today. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe let's start from that. So um, can you demystify the big term migration. I think there's a lot of topics that go into that and it's a really big task to break that down. But um, how would you describe migration in simple terms to maybe a young child? Yeah, so migration is really just someone moving from one place to the, to the other. So really someone changing their place of residence. This can be internal migration, so within the same country. Like, for instance, I moved from Utrecht in the Netherlands to Maastricht. That's internal migration. But I'm also an international migrant. I'm American originally, and I moved from the United States to the Netherlands. Uh, so the migration itself is actually very simple, but it gets very mixed up within the terminology that it's used. So probably even for listeners here, uh, maybe the first time they hear the term migrant or migration, what do they think of? You know, well, for lots of people, the first thing they think of are maybe poor people coming from developing countries or refugees or um, people coming across the Mediterranean on overcrowded boats. You know, these are the kind of emotive images and ideas that people often have when they hear the term migrant. But there's so much about that that's actually problematic because migrants are so, so much more than that. I myself am a migrant, but I'm probably not what first came to mind when you, you know, think of the term migrant. And I think that the term has somehow become very problematized. And in many contexts, the term has almost gained a negative connotation, which is, I think, is also very problematic. And you see that even with migrants themselves. You see, you know, with more highly skilled migrants purposely trying to distance, distance themselves from the term migrant. And they say, oh, no, 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 I'm not a migrant. I'm an expat or I'm a highly skilled migrant or I'm a whatever, right? No, you're a migrant. So anyone that has moved from one country to another, changed their residence, you're a migrant. So I think you're German, right? Yes. And you live in the Netherlands. Yeah. So you're a migrant. But did you ever consider yourself as a migrant? Well, uh, until now, not really <laughs> in that sense, I guess. Um, exactly. Yeah. And a lot of students don't, international students even, um, don't even think of themselves as migrants, even though they are. And so I think what we have to understand better is that migrant or migration really encompasses a very a large group of different kinds of people. And we really need to think of it as the really objective thing that it is, just people moving from one place to another. And it's not good, it's not bad, it just is. Like that is life, that is part of life. And of course you can have good and bad aspects of anything. Well, I think you showed how much it matters today, actually migration <laughs> in our global world, right? I think people are, I suppose, are moving more than, than maybe 20 years ago, right? Uh, I think we all become more global and also more keen on changing the location where we live at, right? For mm -hmm. people studying uh, in Maastricht, for example, coming from all over the world in that sense. So I do think that there's a big relevancy for migration. I think one Absolutely. thing you uh, mentioned were those common misconceptions that also a lot of people have. Mm -hmm. What are those? So there are so many. Oh, yeah. gosh, there's probably yeah. not enough time on that for that on the podcast. But yeah. let's just talk about a couple. So yeah. one common misconception is that basically all the migrants are moving from developing countries to developed countries. That's not true at all. About one third of migrants in the world today are actually moving or have moved from developing countries to developed countries. 
There are plenty of migrants also moving from developing countries to, to, to other developing countries, also about another third of international migration. Migrants moving from developed countries to other developed countries like you and me, right? That's about a quarter of, of international migration today. Then you even have migrants moving from um, developed countries to developing countries. It's not that much, uh, definitely, um, and I think we need to be fair about that. But, you know, you do have international aid workers, um, global company transferees. You also even have retirees who might want to move from a rich country to a country maybe that um, is not as rich but has better weather, is cheaper to live. You know, there are many um, better food in many cases. So there's a lot of different types of mobility. And I think, you know, this idea that, um, everyone's just moving from developing countries to developed countries is wrong. And, an, an, and next to that is this misconception that the main reason people migrate um, is because of poverty. You know, I don't think you or I moved because of poverty, but we moved for other really good reasons, maybe for education. I definitely moved for education at some point. May, you know, another big reason why people move that we're not even talking about now is, is love, family, right? It's a huge reason why people move to... Um, join other family members, for um, to marry, to partner, whatever, um, that's a really important pe reason why people migrate. So they, you know, they migrate for jobs, but jobs don't mean poverty. Jobs means there's an interesting job in another place. Maybe it also has a better wage. Maybe it's more interesting, whatever. But you know, there, there, there are jobs, there's education, there's family reasons. Um, there's also just lifestyle reasons. So probably maybe you yourself or your, your age group is what the one most known for moving for lifestyle reasons, just wanting to experience another culture, another um, place, other ideas, other languages. So there are so many reasons why people migrate. And I think we way too often fixate on things like war and poverty, which are important reasons that people do migrate, but they're not the only reasons. Uh, and I think we need to keep that much more in mind. Maybe if actually, so I started to talk about war and poverty. Um, but another common misconception is actually around refugees. There's very much the common misconception that the majority of refugees today are hosted in developing countries. Probably if you asked the average European or even maybe Dutch or German person on the street, they would think that all the refugees are in the Netherlands or Germany, and that could not be further from the truth. Actually, 85% of all refugees today are actually hosted in developing countries. That is a lot more than the majority. You know, only 15% of refugees today are actually hosted in developing countries, which is really just a drop in the bucket. And if you think about where refugees are actually being hosted, they're being hosted um, in the countries that have fewer resources, you know, both from an economic perspective, but sometimes also just from a practical perspective, like land or water. Um, and so, you know, it's those countries who often have the fewest capabilities to help and to host that are those that are actually doing the most. And I think that's something that we in the quote unquote rich developed world really need to think more about and, and be honest about. Well, you just mentioned the refugees. Um, maybe just jump on that a little more because you I think describe the different motives for people moving and migration in general and their respective reasons and that's nothing bad by itself. Yeah. But at the same time, I think if we take a look at society in general, I'm just speaking of Germany, for example, I do think that the topic of refugees in general is really polarizing. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of people that are really extreme in their views and try to protect something. And there are other people that are really welcome. But my question is now, what role does the media even play in that? So how are those opinions being formed and what can we do to even prevent those wrong opinions or those opinions that are based on wrong facts, how can we pre prevent this from happening? In today's society, is there anything uh, that you can look at? Oh, that's such a good question. Yes. Uh. Okay. So there's a lot there. Um, so one thing that we know is that it is human nature to be afraid of or concerned about or not like the unknown. And what we know is that people in general are less welcoming to people who seem more different than them. So that could be meaning a different skin color, a different language, a different religion. Um, so people generally coming from further away from your country, the hosting population will often feel more threatened by. And that is really because of just, you know, the unknown. And that that's human nature. It doesn't mean it's okay. There are plenty of things about human nature that are not okay. But we also do need to recognize that. And one of the 
the kind of cures to that is familiarity, right? Because the people we're least afraid of or least concerned about are those that we feel like we understand the most, those that look like us, those that understand our slang, whatever. And so some of the best ways to kind of try to combat those things are to um, have more exposure. And of course, more exposure is not always easy when people don't want to be exposed to those things. But I also think that we have to be honest about things. Um, so I mean, I'm a migration scholar in general. I do believe that migration is more good than it is bad and a lot more good than it is bad, but nothing is perfect. And there are always trade-offs and also not every person in our societies is a good person, right? Um, not every German is a good person. Not every American is a good person. And not every refugee is a good person. That is just the way it is. And we need to also recognize that. But, um, you know, if a if one in a million refugees does something wrong, we also need to recognize that, well, one in a million, anyone else also does something wrong. So I think, you know, we need to really make sure that we're comparing apples with apples and that we are more nuanced in understanding about discussions. And the way that the news media also covers this, and I don't want to lump all media together here, is often different. Certain news outlets will cover the same stories in different ways. And Often one is, and there's often some middle ground. There are some news outlets that, you know, migrants can do no wrong and they're only going to ever portray, you know, immigrants as victims or something. And that's also not the case. Immigrants are not only victims. Um, but you also have other news outlets that are, on, that you, you know, you're going to see every time the word migrant is said, it's with some kind of negative other adjective, uh, you know, or, or, or explaining word or it's associated with something bad. So I think, we need to be much more honest about the situation and, well, hopefully the media will, will also do their job better, but we can't just hope for those things. So that's where we also, as academics, need to step in and make sure we're also bringing out correct information and making ourselves available also to media outlets because we're busy all the time and for academics, it's usually also not their first priority to sit down with a journalist. So we need to be doing that more. I think there's so many cool points where we can go from here. Um, yes. One thing that just popped into my mind when you spoke about uncertainty um, was actually in the context of business, innovation, and also entrepreneurship in a sense. Because mm -hmm. when you're an entrepreneur, you mentioned I think you're quite entrepreneurial in your nature as well mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning. Uh, if you're an entrepreneur, you're, I think, good with dancing with uncertainty yep. and taking risks to an extent. Um, how can we link that, uh, like the entrepreneurship thought, uh, with migration and even the attitude towards uncertainty? Um, so like some linkages we can draw. Oh, wow. There's so many. Okay. I feel like there's so yeah. many different directions we can go in here. So one yeah. is that migration is not random. It is not a random event. There is a selection of who decides to migrate. And in general, on average, people that are willing to take the risk to migrate because it is a risky endeavor. You know, you're, you, you need to move to another place, learn new things, create new networks, whatever. Um, so migrants themselves seem to be more risk takers, but risk takers, you know, in a positive way. And, and those are exactly the kind of qualities that you also see in entrepreneurs. And you do see that among some immigrant populations, they have a much higher rate of entrepreneurship than the native population. Um, and migrants themselves are very entrepreneurial in, you know, what they just decide to do. But it's also very clear that immigrants in general really help to increase innovation. And innovation also helps to spur growth. Um, and it's very important for many of the companies and businesses that we have in the world today, especially in the, um, you know, in the West, in the Western developed economy, where innovation is very, very important, all kinds of innovation, you know, product innovation, process innovation, technological innovation. Um, we see that immigrants patent at a much higher rate than natives, um, you know, more than double in many cases, for instance, in the United States. The U.S.'s, um, you know, R&D industry is really propped up by immigrants from other countries. So the U.S. is not great at producing their own scientists. They're great at luring scientists to the United States. And also, I would say, luring um, 
you know, like younger generations coming into innovative universities who do get educated there to some extent and then stay on. So um, there's a lot that we see, even so with business, um, the tech companies in Silicon Valley are disproportionately owned also by immigrants. I think like 16% of tech companies or something like that in Silicon Valley are owned by by immigrants, which is a, a disproportionate amount um, with that regard. So you just see so many ways that the entrepreneurial spirit of immigrants um, can spill over into so many other areas of innovation and growth for many economies. What I find interesting is the correlation between the degree of innovation and also maybe the amount of migration that is happening. So with mm -hmm. innovation, as you talked about research, but also entrepreneurship in a sense, this yeah. startup scene, uh, I wonder what would the government or a country like Germany would need to do differently in order to stimulate that behavior even? Um, is there like something they can do? That's a, Yes, there are things yeah. that governments can do. But there's also a limit to what governments can do, at least in a short period of time. I, I need to be honest about that. So definitely first having policies that are very attractive to highly skilled migrants are very important here because there's, cur there's currently a global race for talent. Um, countries in the world want the best and the brightest all over the world. So who's going to get them? So the countries that have a reputation already for already attracting other bests and brightest because you want to be in, you know, you, a country can have an amazing policy to bring, you know, a highly skilled migrant. But if you're in the middle of nowhere and there are no other highly skilled migrants around, nobody wants to go there. So you do need some kind of infrastructure for that, which countries like Germany and the United States and Canada, Canada actually do. Um, but next to that, you also need some really interesting policies. So you need it to be easy for the person to get into the country, maybe easier access to citizenship after some time. It needs to be easy to bring in family members. You might want to have tax breaks. So a country, a country like the Netherlands um, has a tax break for highly skilled immigrants that come in also for a limited period of time, but the idea to help attract them. Um, you know, you want to make sure that they, if they're moving their whole family, that they don't have to deal with import duties and all these other things. So there are plenty of ways to make it easy for highly skilled migrants to uh, emigrate to countries. But one thing is attracting and the other thing is retaining. And some countries are really good at attracting and retaining and others are not. So I would say, for instance, a country like Germany is not bad at attracting, but not great at retaining. And part of that honestly has to do with language, um, particularly in a very kind of anglicized world. You can move to Germany and uh, work in a, you know, Fortune 500 company, whatever, multinational company with your English skills, but your daily life, you're probably going to need German for. And that's where things get a bit tricky because you, maybe you come as a highly skilled family and now your partner is maybe with the kids and they are having a hard time in day-to-day -day life, even though you're sailing through things in your job. So that's where normal life makes it a little bit harder. Um, so obviously um, families that already speak German when they come to Germany, so maybe Austrians or Swiss or whatever, are going to often have an easier time of making that next integration process. And that is the reason why, you know, countries that are also known for their multicultural environments and um, and English speaking and accessibility, like Canada, for instance, are very popular among highly skilled migrants. That brings me to, I think it's called the globalization hypothesis, meaning mm -hmm. that the cultures will merge in a sense uh, on the global scale. If I recall that correctly, if not, please correct me. Mm -hmm. um, how do you look at this also when thinking about the future, maybe the next 10, 20 years? Um, how does this hold or how does that change uh, in, in the global world? That's a good question. And I mean, well, I mean, there's just globalization, right? It's not just about migration. Um, but you do see, especially among this kind of, this group that I was always ta already talking about, like the, in this global race for talent, you do see this very international elite. Um, and no matter what country they're coming from, you also do see that group having a culture of its own. Um, and a more similar culture. So you see, you know, like expat areas. So it's not that all the Americans or all the Germans or all the Spanish or whatever are hanging out together, but you see that all the expats are hanging out together. All the highly skilled migrants are hanging out together. So that is definitely a cultural phenomenon that we are seeing and that this is breeding its own culture. 
But of course, migration helps to spread culture and spread cultural ideals. We actually call this social remittances. So remittances in general is the transfer of something. We can think about monetary remittances, which is the transfer of money, which we talk about a lot in development and migration and development. But social remittances are the transfer of norms and ideas and, and knowledge. And that is absolutely something that's being moved around the globe also because of, of migration. And we are starting to see, of course, um, new types of ideas that we haven't seen in certain places before. And that can be good or that can be bad, depending on who you ask. Very cool. There's one topic I also would like to just quickly hear your opinion about mm -hmm. also in the context of migration, which is education. I think you already well mentioned with your YouTube channel, that's also a form of education and how you can well spread knowledge uh, on a global mm -hmm. scale. Um, so I do think that also with the internet and the rise of um, technology like YouTube to make content accessible to everyone in the world, right? Yeah. There's also a huge uh, impact on education in general. So um, how How can you help me to basically arrange the terms of education, migration, and even globalization um, oh. in that puzzle? Oh, <laughs> so many things. So yeah. if we think, uh, I feel like I just gave my students recently a, a test question like this. Oh, um, but, <laughs> so uh, listen up. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, so if you think about migration and education, you can think about it in so many different ways. So one thing is like the migration for education. So, I mean, nowadays you also see um, an incredible internationalization of higher education. You're seeing more and more mobile students than we've seen at any other time in the, um, in the past. And it's not that also international students are only going to OECD rich high income countries. There's plenty of international migration also um, among developing countries specifically for educational purposes. Then you can also see um, just within migration in general, so maybe someone didn't specifically migrate for education, but if you come with a parent who's migrated, you need to go into that educational system. And you can also look at um, what we see in educational systems with child migrants. You know, it also depends, outcomes depend a lot on when they enter the educational system, how old they are, the socioeconomic background of their parents, the schooling systems, all kinds of things. And there are some cases where we actually see immigrant children heavily outperforming local children. We also see other instances when immigrant children are underperforming. And there, you know, may be very specific reasons for that, that we can target with good policy. If you look at also education back in countries of origin or the countries where the migrants are coming from, what's interesting is that I talked a little bit about financial remittances previously. So the money that migrants are often sending back to their families in their countries of origin disproportionately goes into funding the education of children in the households that stay behind. And this really helps um, those children to reach higher levels of educational attainment, which is extremely important. And it allows them to maybe not have to work and to go to school instead, to be able to pay for school fees or books. Um, it allows them um, to uh, be able to maybe get extra tutoring or things like that. But at the same time, also, it migration often helps to increase aspirations of the people that stay behind. So you see the interesting, you know, and uh, varied life you could have if you migrate. And that a good way to do that is by getting higher education, maybe becoming a nurse or a doctor or something that's very transferable to other countries. And you see more people actually gaining higher levels of education, specifically with the idea to be able to go abroad and have more opportunities in the future. So just the idea of migration can trigger a whole set of wanting to get you know, higher levels of, of education. Now, in general, we see that the relationship between migration and education is extremely positive but I also don't want to oversell it. There are some situations very in very specific contexts where migration could perhaps also lead to less education. Um, and we see this, for instance, in some very specific areas of Mexico where m mainly the migration is going to be of lower skilled workers to the United States and it's very clear what kind of jobs they're going to be in. And if they stop school at grade 10 or 11 or 12, especially for young males, they're not really going to see a difference in the payoff in the labor market later. So you might see them stopping at grade 10 instead of grade 12, which is obviously then not good for educational attainment. So there, it really depends on what the possibilities are afterwards and what the incentive structures are. So we have to be honest about that too. But in general, migration leads to higher levels of education. 
I think the one term that popped up a couple of times uh, during our chat until now is also policy, which seems mm -hmm. to be a really central piece in using migration for a good, good purpose, right? For yes. maximizing utility for society or even the world, right? Mm -hmm. So how are you looking at the current state of policy work around the world? I know it's a really general question, probably hard to answer, but still, how does the current state of policy work look like? Is it effective? Is it done in a good way? Or is there something we should change? Oh, okay. That's a huge question. Okay, sorry. So <laughs> there, there's also not an easy answer to that yeah. because, you know, well, we have a lot of different kinds of policies and every country can make their own policy. So some countries have good policies in certain areas. Other countries have terrible policies in certain areas. The same country can have a very good policy in one area of migration and a really bad policy in another area of migration. Um, so look, something that I think all governments should be doing that a lot are not doing is linking labor migration to labor needs. Seems very simple, seems very intuitive, seems smart, right? But most governments don't do that because migration is a political issue that most of the policymaking around that is really done based on political whims and has nothing to do with evidence. So I think that's where we could start. We can start with evidence. We can start with just linking migration to labor market needs. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and uh, we also need to be serious about, uh, about integration um, and making sure that resources and good policy are there to also help with integration. And integration, notice I said integration and I did not say assimilation. So I do not mean that immigrants have to look like the locals or look like who we call natives. Um, They need to be helped. So we consider integration a two-way process where locals come to meet the immigrants and immigrants come to meet the locals, right? So you have to have some kind of like base foundation of like kind of values or whatever that you ascribe to. But then there needs to be room for mixing, for mingling, uh, for change on both sides and for understanding on both sides. And I think there's a lot more that can be done there in the way of policy to make that happen better. So, for instance, the Netherlands used to have a pretty decent policy in this regard um, after the financial crisis and many austerity measures. Basically, most of the funding for integration has been completely pulled and more into more there have been um, more policies and more rules around immigrants' integration, but it's all the onus is on the immigrant to do everything without the hosting society kind of helping in any way. And that, I think, is quite problematic. Um, at least the policy in Germany, for instance, is a bit different. There's an officially a Well, an official welcoming culture um, to try to make immigrants feel more welcome. And for instance, language classes in Germany are basic, are virtually free, are highly, highly subsidized. So it makes it very easy for immigrants from anywhere, also from EU countries, whatever, to go in and start to learn German classes. That is not the case in the Netherlands. For someone to learn Dutch in the Netherlands will cost you the same or more than to do a master's. So And if we're putting all of the pressure on the immigrant to learn the language and then maybe to pass certain exams to be able to stay in the country, depending on what kind of visas you're on, that gives a very different message. So I think there's a lot that policy can be done both with regard to immigration, so people coming into a country, but also with regard to integration. And then, of course, there are policies around refugees and asylum seekers, right? I mean, I don't want to go too much into all of this, but the reason that you accept and give safe haven to asylum seekers and to refugees is a completely different reason than you bring in labor migrants. And these things also need to be decoupled, even though refugees can be great for your labor market and when helped to integrate properly also into the labor market by, for instance, helping with language acquisition and making sure that um, diplomas are recognized, because that's a big problem from country to country. Um, I mean, refugees can be fantastic um, members of society and uh, um, very helpful for labor markets and aging populations. But I think the reasons that you create policies in these different areas need to be different and they need to be separated. And letting in asylum seekers and refugees is much more of a humanitarian issue and something that we should do to help our fellow man. And it's not about our own labor market. So I think we need to um, to also make differing policies there and uh, and. I also think we just need to be good people. But um, I think we need to be good people in good societies backed up by evidence in our policies. And that's when we can get some really good results. 
Well, I think it was really insightful to what should be changed in some extent, right? I think integration really stood out to me. Mm -hmm. It's a two-way street. It's not just a one-way process where yeah. they should do all the work um, combined with basing policy decisions in evidence, right? And not just the political yeah. swings that uh, a country might have. <laughs> I think a lot of a lot of takeaways here. Uh, let's try to wrap this uh, up our chat today. Um, I'd like to always, in the end, ask a little bit about how What would you change in the future? So what is like one wish you would have for the field of migration, even in general, um, in the foreseeable future? Is there such a wish that you could formulate? Well, I guess from a policy perspective, my wish would be that um, policy is actually linked to evidence and, uh, and, and good policy. I mean, uh, you know, also the School of Governance and you and you merit, what we're trying to do is create evidence that hopefully goes into evidence-based policymaking. And as I told you before, migration is one of the areas where so little actual real evidence is used to go into policymaking. So that would be like my one very big wish, I guess, um, for that to happen. And as far as um, for the academic field, I think another wish um, is that academics get out there more and share their knowledge in a more accessible way with society. Well, I do think it's an inspiring word to end this on. Um, so thank you again for taking time, Melissa. For everyone that is listening or watching, make sure to check out her channel uh, at Melissa Siegel. Uh, just Google it or go on YouTube and search and uh, look at your videos. Um, yeah, again, thank you very much. I think it was really insightful in many dimensions uh, for me, but also hopefully the audience. And I'm happy to welcome everyone else then back to another episode really soon. And yeah, thank you, Melissa. Thanks so much. <laughs>